Welcome to another edition of Real Life Renos, the podcast. I'm your host, Karen Brown. And for those who are new to the podcast, I'm an aging in place and accessibility strategist. Today, we're going to talk about our hopes, wishes, and dreams for accessibility in 2024. And to do that, I am joined by one of my favorite guests, Ron Wickman. Ron is an architect who spent his career working with accessible design, and he joins us from Edmonton, Alberta. Welcome, Ron. Uh, Thanks. It's uh, great to be back. Um, Actually, I kind of, one of my hopes would be to do more of these this year. (laughs) We can make that come true. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. We are going to start off by taking a look at uh, a document that contains survey results. It was a survey that was done by the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. It's rather lengthy, so we won't go through all of it. But um, Ron, if you'd like to speak to this, I think it's a really interesting article. I read the whole thing, as did you, and it's all marked up because we were having a an email conversation back and forth about it. Yeah, it's it's uh, quite interesting. When I, when I read the article myself, um, I was pleasantly surprised at the uh, at, at the uh, results, um, meaning that uh, a vast majority of of uh, Canadians um, are very interested in in uh, making our uh, built environment more inclusive. And uh, inclusive is a pretty lofty word. It uh, doesn't always relate to just accessibility or disability issues, but inclusion for um, everybody. Um, and that means everybody. So um, I think most people are well aware of, of uh, issues that are happening, uh, especially here in North America uh, with people of, of uh, different skin color, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, I find that a lot of times our discussions about inclusive, inclusivity um, doesn't always include people with disabilities. So uh, I think that this study does show that uh, a good number of people really uh, want us to, uh, as architects, to to weigh in and and do a better job of making our our uh, built environment more accessible for people with disabilities. Uh, other issues uh, like climate, uh, fighting climate change, I think is uh, has been around for a little while now, uh, more than 25 years, uh, but it's also at the forefront of, of our thinking uh, these days. And uh, the other thing that I, I certainly, I was uh, very interested in when I was in school as well, is this idea of uh, engaging people uh, when we design as architects as well. So uh, a lot of times I think, uh, and too often we think that uh, because we've been trained, we know better. And so we just design um, accordingly, uh, but, uh, nobody knows better what they need than the people who actually use the spaces. So uh, certainly my work, uh, uh, which is focused on people with disabilities, I can't design without including my my clients in, in the design process. So that's something that uh, certainly is, uh, is uh, high amongst uh, younger architects uh, entering into the, into the profession. So uh, very optimistic in my thinking uh, as we move forward. Um, towards uh, creating a more a, a more inclusive, uh, socially engaging, and uh, environmentally friendly uh, built environment. One of the statistics, if I remember the number correctly from reading through this, just to speak to what you said about involving people in the process, of all the people who had ever commented on a development in their community, 46% of them didn't feel like they were being heard. Only 7% felt like anybody was really paying attention to what they were saying, which is kind of sad. It, it, that's right. And, and again, the, I think what, what happens is, uh, certainly in my experience, as a, uh, let's say just a, a citizen, um, when, when things are happening around the city uh, initiatives uh, here in Edmonton, uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, bike lanes, for example, and changes to public transit and so on. Uh, that kind of that kind of information is uh, out there in kind of social media, uh, and then they have uh, work sh- work uh, shops, I guess you could say, or open houses where people can come in and and uh, raise their concerns and give those give their opinions. But by and large, uh, 
you have to be pretty savvy uh, and know what's going on in the city to know that these events are happening and uh and then they're not always you, you know that open really they're like it's one day um maybe during the day people work uh, so, so the, often I think the, the bureaucratic people, the city administration thinks, well, you know, we are making it available. You can weigh in and give your opinions, but it's not really as open, um, as, as one might think. Uh, and then in defense of all of that, how do you get people to, to, uh, an open house and so on? A lot of people just don't, um, unfortunately don't really care as much about things until it really, you know, kind of hits their backyard, so to speak. So it just, it, overall, we just need a more kind of engaging community, um, spirit to, to, um, get our, get our cities to be more you know, socially responsible and, um, uh, environmentally friendly and, and certainly more inclusive. I also feel that voter turnouts, give us a lot of information. Just if we look at the numbers, the voter turnouts have been really low. Um, and at the municipal level, which is the level of government closest to the people, it, those low numbers really tell me how much they think it really matters what their vote is. The decisions are going to be made and they're just going to go on with their lives. And and yeah, they don't turn up for budget meetings. I mean, <laughs> At my local council, maybe one or two people will come and sit in the gallery for the budget meetings, and that's about it. And it's not that people don't care what their taxes are. It's they feel that, I think it just doesn't matter. But if we were more engaged, it's it's sort of a, a rock and a hard place, because I feel like if people were more engaged, then they would do a better job of electing people who truly represented what the community wants. Instead, especially in small communities, we elect based on who's popular, who talks to you in the grocery store? Who's your buddy that you went to school with and grew up with? You know, that kind of voting is the wrong way to look at it, in my yeah. view. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, my 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 background uh, has uh, been in in politics and and um, activism. Uh, just because of the nature of how I grew up with a father who did use a wheelchair and was a um, civic politician and a provincial MLA here in Alberta, uh, an activist. Uh, so it's, it's in my blood. And uh, I, I've kind of steered away from becoming a politician, um, but I'm very political in my, in my uh, the way that I work as an architect and the way I engage uh, uh, our, our, uh, our politicians. So, uh, I am personally quite active in, in talking with, uh, with various politicians and try to get them to, to buy into a lot of these ideas. Um, but by and large, it, I think they're uh, certainly more than ever in my, uh, in my view, uh, this feeling of, uh, hopelessness amongst the vote voters is certainly there. And, um, it seems no matter what we do, um, uh, the, the, um, the politicians are just going to make decisions that benefit them or, or whatever. I'm not even sure what their, what their goals are anymore, um, in terms of what, what our cities could look like and, and, and what our culture could, could be like. Right. So it just, we seem a little bit lost right now in that, in that sense. And, um, I don't know how to. I don't know how to get us back on on track. No, that's okay. You, it's a you. You made a good segue just a, a few seconds ago. Um, we were going to talk about hopes and dreams. So when you're talking yeah. about wanting things to be different, what would your number one hope, dream, wish be for 2024? It, it it's it's this idea of education for sure, and and that's been that's been at the core of my hopes. And as I start <laughs> begin every new year, uh, <laughs> is like how how do we educate people? And uh, I remember way back in the mid nineties, the nineteen nineties, uh, having been the author of uh, uh, what's called a flex housing project, which uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation uh, had a competition where they asked uh, architects and builders to come up with ideas on how to create housing that's 
more adaptable, uh, more flexible for different a different variety of uh, family types, multi generational housing, uh, people working at home. Uh, uh, garden suites for parents that uh, are coming back to live with their children, children that aren't leaving their home, and of course, uh, being accommodating for people with disabilities, especially as they age. And, you know, 95, I remember doing a talk at a CMHC uh, function where I was asked whether this flex housing concept is a is a trend or a niche market. And, and I said, it's a, it's a niche market right now, but in the next five years, I believe it'll be a trend. That was roughly 1995. So my my thinking was that by 2000 we'd be we'd be all over this flex housing idea and all of this. Well, it's 2024, <laughs> and we're 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 still not there. So so um, uh, I guess it, it, the, the the education. Um, first and foremost is looking at a kind of global uh, concept of educating as many people as we can. So that would include uh, our politicians, our decision makers, uh, builders and developers, uh, uh, other architects and designers, uh, the general public, the building industry, the sub trade, the trades, uh, just really try to educate in, a, in, a, in the most global sense possible and uh my my um just quickly my second hope is seeing as i kind of said it already is again this idea of the next five so now you know 2024 by 2029 2030 let's say um thereabouts um can we can we achieve this goal uh of of um having this higher education and something i've been saying for the last number of years now is that uh I think a big missing piece in this education is that we still haven't achieved a, a critical mass of people who really understand what what uh, inclusion, what uh, disability issues are really all about. And uh, in our in our world of climate change and sustainable uh, issues, design, we have achieved a critical mass. So. When you have the media out there talking about the issues or interviewing experts, uh, they themselves have quite a good understanding of the issues. So the, the conversation between somebody, a reporter, let's say, and an expert is more engaging, more informative because there's a real dialogue as opposed to somebody just saying, well, what do you think? Or tell me what you know. Um, so it's, it's not one-sided. And I'm hoping that we can, I can get to a point where I feel like I'm no longer just educating. Um, I want to be in a position where I feel like I'm being educated myself. So I want to be uh, in a group of peers who have a similar understanding as myself so that we can really dig deep into the issues and come up with very good and clever solutions. That's a, a noble wish, and I would certainly hope that that would come true. And, and it's actually very closely aligned with, pardon the honking, I'm actually in a very active construction zone right now, and it sounds like the <laughs> snack truck may have shown up, so <laughs> we'll, we'll just keep on going. Um, so my number one wish would be that homeowners and tenants alike would educate themselves about the possibilities that are available to them. As we've discussed before, we have this stock of old houses that have not really changed in terms of building methods and the barriers that are inherently built in houses for decades and decades. So people are having to deal with houses that actually have a lot of potential to injure them. There are things we can do to alleviate that. And the information is out there. It's it's perhaps harder to find when people hire people like you or like me. It's second nature to us and we can certainly tell them. But that's not something that everybody is going to do. Instead, what I find is that people become frozen with fear. They just, they don't know which way to go. They don't know what decision is best. And so they do nothing. As I say to them often, not making a decision is making a decision. And 
I think that what maybe governments at all levels need to understand is that if we build homes that actually allow people to live safely, independently, and with dignity, they can stay there longer. There's there's an effect on the healthcare system. I think in terms of the illnesses that people have, the injuries that people have, the that that the need for long term care would reduce. That you know, people would perhaps only have to leave their homes for the last year or two of their lives when they may need more care or highly specialized care. Um, that that would be for me if people would take the time to educate themselves. Uh, there's a lot of good material out there. They can listen to these podcasts. We've done podcasts on entry and bathrooms and vertical access that give people a ton of information. So those kinds of things I think would be really cool. I think my second wish aligns with yours very well also, that governments at all levels would embrace accessible, visitable, and adaptable housing. Um, as, as I have said to you, uh, online and offline, when a project comes to a municipality or a county and they put restrictions on them, like we want 20% of the homes to be accessible or 10% to be visitable, the builders don't like that. And they'll just go down the road to the next municipality or county that doesn't give them those restrictions because, of course, they're in business to make money. Completely understand that. Um, however, that's not necessarily building the way that people need. As, as I just said, we haven't changed our methods in a long time. The, the flex housing that you brought up, you would call it flex housing. I'd call it adaptable housing. I think we're talking about exactly the same thing. Um, yes. Yeah, we are. This, yeah. this business of a home that people can buy. And I mean, housing is expensive. So once you're able to get into that, do you need somebody to help pay the rent? Well, why don't we build a, a section, a, a self-contained apartment? You could take down the wall at some point if you wanted to, or leave it up, whatever, that a tenant could be in and help pay the rent. Maybe as your children get older and come home from college or they're working their first job and they need to save money, that's where they could live. Maybe mom and dad ultimately move into that space while an older child takes over the main house. And then that is generational living, which is gaining in popularity. There are so many more things that we could do if only we would embrace flex housing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and, and just to, to talk a little bit about, uh, more about flex housing for those that don't know, yeah. uh, it, it, the term flex housing uh, was coined by uh, a gentleman who worked at Canada Morgan Housing, and it really uh, encompassed, encompassed three words, which was affordable, adaptable, and accessible. So uh, adaptable in the sense that you just uh, talked about so not not just for adaptable to accommodate somebody let's say who goes from uh, walking around to being in a wheelchair but adaptable in the sense of how we can live so this idea of having um, a home that lends itself to having a, a suite for for uh, a mom or dad that comes to live with their kid their adult kids or the the adult child who um, is in university and and um, can't or doesn't want to um, move yet, right? So um, people uh, working out of their home, uh, again, in 1995, these were a bit more novel in, in terms of their, their thoughts. Um, and it was, it was quite popular and CMHC really promoted it for a good, I'd say a good 10 years maybe. Um, and, and after about five years, it started to sort of fade a little bit. And the CMHC then focused its attention on uh, on sustainable issues and climate change and so on, creating net zero housing, that sort of thing. And it's only been, again, in the last uh, five years or so that um, the Canada Merchant Housing has, has uh, uh, approached me, uh, now younger people that um, are just reading about flex housing for the first time, asking me what... Um, what I know about it. <laughs> I go, well, I know right. quite a bit about it. <laughs> so, so, but the flex, the flex housing concept has become uh, more of an issue today because of our aging population. So now it's being recognized that, oh, this, these are all really good ideas because 
we have hit a, certainly a critical mass of uh, older people out there now that we're going, wow, this is like a real, there's a real housing issue here, right? So, right. so now these issues are sort of coming back again. But, um, you know, for me, I guess it just, it, it seems a little bit unfortunate that it, it, it ha I have this feeling that we're like starting over again, right? Like I have to re-educate people about flex housing because the ones that started it are retired or, you know, passed, passed on, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, it, it is a little bit <laughs> tricky sometimes uh, to go, wow, okay, we got to, we got to try this one again, right? Um, we could, we could actually modernize the concept a little bit by not having the flex part of the housing of the house built into the house because so many municipalities and counties now are wanting and allowing one two or even in some cases three additional homes on the same property so yeah. i mean there's nothing more bizarre to me than somebody saying they've got a granny suite and it's in the basement yeah yeah that, that's right yeah. that just yeah hits and me there, there are, wrong but if, if there was a granny suite in the back that could be the flex mm -hmm. and if only like i know builders want to build on these 33 foot lots if only on that first floor they would build a den or even a dining room that could eventually be transitioned into a primary bedroom and a washroom that has a euro shower because that sounds way sexier mm -hmm. than yeah barrier free shower or even a wet room we've talked about wet rooms before if if only they would do that sort of thing there's your flexibility yeah exactly and um that's a it's those are really great points and and it sort of brought to my attention again reminded me that the the big shift in this flex housing concept uh with the current members of canada margin housing is that uh, they do think about it as a multifamily uh, housing situation rather than the single family housing situation. So in, in 1995, we were completely focused on this idea that we could make single family homes more adaptable, more affordable, more accessible. Uh, today, conditions are such that that's a big challenge, especially the affordability bit right, to single family housing. So CMHC now is saying, uh, in terms of the flex housing concept, it really does relate to to multifamily. So uh, low rise apartment buildings, condos, uh, to taller condo buildings, and they're really focusing their attention on that and and realizing that this, the single family house is still uh, something that's not uh, uh, attainable by, by a lot of people anymore, unfortunately, yeah. Right, right. And and just one other thing I just wanted to add that I think is really important to your your hope, your first one, uh, uh, um, about educating um, the public, uh, mm -hmm. the people who are want this this kind of housing. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, you know just having having like a, a no step entrance, for example, we've talked about this issue before in our, in podcasts that we've done previously. Uh, but, you know, essentially not having steps at the front door. So pretty much anybody can get in. Um, but that includes uh, somebody using a walk or somebody in a wheelchair, uh, young parents pushing a baby carriage, somebody carrying a bike, people carrying furniture, all of these things uh, uh, make life easier if you have no steps at the front door. Uh, what happens is uh, your 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 buying public might read an article or or see see a feature on the news and they go oh this no step entrance that's a great idea and then they go to their builder and they say I'd like to I'd like to build a house without steps at the front door and the builders will actually say oh you can't do that the code doesn't allow you to do that so again that goes back to that lack of education and the homeowner doesn't have the knowledge to challenge what the builder is saying so then they go ahead and build the house with steps and the right. builders are wrong they're they're you know i'm not saying every builder of course not but uh a lot of builders will do that either because they really don't know that it can be done or they just don't want to learn themselves right they just want to get the sale and get it built and cookie cutter and make their money you know so um 
it's it's that's the challenge that you're talking about that's that's you know obviously something that i'm i've been working on as well for for quite a length of time right right what would be your third wish yeah well first first i'm gonna just go back to my second wish because i the second wish is a bit more specific uh to to this idea of education and what i'm really interested in uh today uh, as an architect is is dealing with the the uh, idea of accessibility and and for me accessibility relates to people with disabilities so uh, in my own definition of things when we talk about inclusive housing um, or inclusive design or even universal design um, we really are talking about um, all people um, anywhere, you know, age eight to 80 kind of thing. Um, uh, there's a um, urban design firm that calls themselves eight to 80. Uh, so uh, when, when I speak of accessibility, then I speak of it as specific to uh, people with disabilities. And, and so I'm trying to uh, make sure that other designers, especially um, and architects, because that's my profession, understand this concept so that when they do get involved in issues around climate change and, and fighting climate change with their designs, uh, dealing with the disaster relief, which is a lot of disaster disasters are happening because of climate change. Um, and, and most importantly for me is this issue around affordable housing. In our quest to create more environmentally friendly buildings, uh, create housing quickly after a natural disaster, like a fire or a flood, um, or create affordable housing, what often happens is the, the needs of people with disabilities are forgotten because all of the other issues sort of rise to the top and they're hard enough, right? So if I come along and say, well, you know, what about, what about people in wheelchairs? It's like, oh man, that's just, you've just added another layer to this that just makes our quest to find solutions that much harder right so that's that's kind of what i talk about the next five years i'd like to really hone in on those issues specifically and you, you used a really funny analogy when we were talking a couple of weeks ago about the stanley mm. i think this is a this is a great time to repeat that on our podcast yeah, yeah. yeah. it is kind of funny yeah because i it is um i i and and now I'm hearing like since we we spoke a couple of weeks ago, um, people are paying astronomical amounts of money to get these cups. Like it's just it's really bizarre. I know. Um, and and I I think what's um, and again I'm not the expert on Stanley mugs, but uh, <laughs> it was the analogy. <laughs> yeah, apparently they're like incredibly durable. They they keep your liquids inside cold or hot forever and so not only are they sort of style i don't know maybe stylish i guess or they're they're you know people want to have them because they're kind of cool but they really work and i think ultimately that's why people are really buying into them is is uh it really works and then after you know after something like this gains traction then it you know, it almost becomes a bit of a style thing. Like you, you have to have one because, you know, everybody else does. But um, when we were talking about that, I, I was, uh, I was saying that um, I would love to see that happen in this world of the no step entrance. Like, could we create a buzz around the no step entrance that everybody sees the benefits of it and they just, they have to have it and they're willing yep. to even pay more money for it, right? And and what I can tell you is that it does not cost more money to do a no-step entrance um, once you've once you've overcome, you know, having done it a couple of times. Um, it's always a little, when you've never done something before, it just takes time to learn. And, and sometimes you make a bit of a mistake and it costs some money, but eventually you get to a point where it really doesn't cost um, anything more. Right. But then we want to get to that point. And the analogy I used in the building industry that is kind of, um, you know, I guess similar to the, the sort of Stanley Mug concept is the engineered uh, uh, truss. So in my time, um, having graduated in the early 
early 1990s and got into this uh, architecture field, we were building houses with what we call dimensional lumber. So that's two by eights, two by tens, two by twelve. So they're they're uh, they're used for our floor joists specifically. And um, one of the common complaints about the floor joist was that in time, because they're made of wood, they they dry um, they dry over time um, when they're in an indoor environment, and uh, you put uh, wood um, wood flooring on top. Uh, your subfloor is, is wood and the wood joists and, and you nail them in and uh, eventually you start getting little creaks and, and uh, sounds that uh, as you walk on the floor. And these seem to be really annoying for people that owned houses like that. And the engineered floor truss came along and it doesn't shrink. It's, it's an engineered, uh, it's, it's, it's engineered. So, um, that was the original idea of, of promoting this uh, floor system. They called it the silent floor system. So no more squeaks. And that was really how it was promoted. And I think a lot of people were like, yeah, okay, that's great. Uh, but when you looked at how much extra it would cost at the time, it was about three times uh, the cost of dimensional lumber. And it was only after some people started using these, these uh, engineered floor joists that they realized, well, you can actually span greater distances with these trusses. Um, so you would eliminate uh, uh, bearing walls or teleposts in your basement. Uh, the, um, the middle of the trusses uh, were open to get uh, some heating duct work uh, uh, through the truss space. Uh, electrical wires and so on, plumbing lines. So all of a sudden you could have in your basement a sort of smooth ceiling without uh, little bump downs and and bulkheads and that sort of thing. And uh, a lot of people thought, well, that's, that's uh, that would give my basement a more stylish look and that's kind of a great thing. Uh, and then the, the, of course, the trades, the plumbers, the electricians, the heating contractors, they found it much easier to work with and thus it reduced their their hours and their fees to uh, um, do the work. And so all of a sudden within, um, I graduated in 1991. So in 1991, it's all dimensional lumber, uh, engineered trusses are more expensive. So they're only for people that are willing to spend the money on them. By 1994, 95, uh, it had almost completely sh shifted to the engineered truss. And they were now on par, if not cheaper than dimensional lumber. So in a, in a very short period of time, that, that, that whole part of the industry completely shifted because again, I would say there was a critical mass of people understanding all of the benefits of, of the trust. So it wasn't just, it was benefiting the builder and they were making more money um, or it was benefiting somebody in the, in the a buyer. Um, it was benefiting everybody overall. So everybody saw the, the, the value of this. And again, I would go back to um, the no step entrance or you called the Euro bathroom or I call it the wet room. Euro you know, shower, this idea, yeah. yeah, the Euro shower, like the idea of yeah. creating a bathroom that's like a big wet room, right? We've talked about that one too. Yep. Um, those two are just key to our building industry. Um, if we can, those two things, if they were just standard, uh, it would be a game changer for sure. So we've got to make everybody want it the way that everybody wants a Stanley. <laughs> Correct. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> I've been work I've been trying to figure that out. But if anybody <laughs> is is listening and is a, has some marketing ideas, uh, <laughs> go I think for you it. Could probably you could probably make a lot of money uh, um, doing this, right? So uh, it it I think it'll come, but it's just like how do we speed up the process, right? To so that uh, we can just be there a lot sooner. Right. Well, I, that may segue into my third wish, which is a, around a, a federal announcement that was made in December. And I'll, I'll just show the announcement. There it is. They're reviving a wartime housing program. Um, now, I remember wartime houses. My grandmother had one. And as I recall, there weren't a lot of different designs. Hers was two bedroom, one bathroom, a kitchen, and then an open living and dining space. There was a basement. 
So what the federal government is proposing to do is come up with a catalog of homes. Now, as they note here, in many instances, these homes were built in a period of about 36 hours. So they want to bring forward a catalog of pre-approved design ideas and then give them to builders. Now, let me just scroll down here a little further. There's a picture of some of them. Yeah, they were just tiny little boxes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at uh, pre-approved designs for multiplexes, for mid-rise buildings, student housing, seniors, residences, and other small to medium scale residential properties. And these will include garden suites and laneway homes and different kinds of houses that will solve today's challenges. So mm. my wish would be that these would be accessible or at the very least adaptable <clears throat> because they they are single story for the most part. I mean, there's the multi-rise, but they're single story in and of themselves. Um, the It's the washroom primarily there as well as the no-step entry for the things that are such as garden houses and, mm. and the like. But having the Euro shower or a wet room, probably the wet room would be more in keeping with the budget numbers that they want to stick with. That would be my wish is that these designs would at the very least include, if not all be accessible, keeping in mind that the people who are going to be using these will want barrier free living to keep them healthier and safer longer. And again, mm-hmm. to to reduce that impact on the healthcare system. Absolutely, yeah. That I mean, that that totally ties you know back into the, the what I was talking about with my second wish, right? Is the yes. is that we we come up with these great ideas and these initiatives to tackle issues around affordable housing, for example, but we can't uh, forget that um, we need to make sure that they're accessible. And when when we're building new, uh, there's no reason to th- to uh, think that we can't do it, um, and the 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 wet room bathroom concept, you it it'd be kind of tight for somebody in a larger wheelchair, but if you take your very basic bathroom, which is typically five feet by eight feet, that's a toilet, a sink, and a bathtub. If you turn that into a wet room, so it's just a, a toilet, a sink, and a shower area, um, you're not you're just you're just making it a wet room um, and you're not making the space bigger so you're not making the house bigger uh, and if you if you just make sure that you grade your land so that there's no steps at the, the door um, Voila. you're done yeah it's it's uh, and I think I, I, I think using the term adaptable probably uh, in terms of a kind of a marketing idea um, makes more sense to people. I, st- I still think there's a stigma around this idea of accessibility being about people with disabilities and, and uh, far too many people go, uh, I'll never get there. <laughs> like I'll never, I'll never be there. Uh, even when I'm 90, I won't be, you know, I won't have a disability. I'll just be 90. <laughs> yes, they will. You know, I was thinking that firm that, that you mentioned that calls themselves eight to 80 should call themselves birth yeah. to death. Really, yeah, birth, yeah, birth yeah, to yeah. death would be far more yeah, appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> And, and um, I, you know, I'm, I can't help but think of a, a quote I heard from, uh, her name is Eleanor Smith. So she started the concept of visitability. And uh, I read in one of the articles that, that she wrote. Uh, so she started the, the visitability concept in the 80s uh, in Atlanta. And um, she said, you know, a no-step entrance uh, helps everyone and, and hurts no one. So it, you, you can't really... F- I mean, you can fall at a no-step entrance, I guess, but, um, you know, stairs just only make it a little bit harder for so many people, right? And a lot so harder stairs, for others. But yeah, there's no advantage to stairs, really. No. Um, and and I would argue the same thing about the, uh, the, the sort of this idea of the curbless shower area or the wet room. You're not really hurting anybody. You're, you're just making a much more flexible bathroom space. Uh, you're not really changing the way you use things. Um, uh, you know, other than the fact that, uh, you know, we're used to kind of having bathtubs all the time too. So uh, that's a a bit of a thing, but um, it, it shouldn't be that hard to, to sort of sell those two features really. Uh, A kitchen is, is a whole nother 
uh, issue that uh, there's a big difference between an, I would say, an adaptable kitchen and an accessible kitchen. Um, uh, where, you know, accessible kitchen, you would have a lot of space underneath the counters open and therefore you lose you know, a lot of valuable storage space and so on. So uh, that's a bit of a, tr a tricky thing, but um, you can make, you can make your kitchen cabinets adaptable. So you can have cabinets under sinks and cooktops where you can pull them out uh, if you need to, or put them back in if you want to, that kind of thing. So again, it just needs some, it needs some creative thinking. Um, but a lot of this stuff, uh, once, it, once it becomes more commonplace, like the engineered floor truss, uh, once it becomes commonplace, it really becomes equal on par with, uh, you know, just your standard costs of everything else. Do you remember a show called Bewitched? Oh, yeah. So it's on like the oldies channel and I will yep. occasionally watch it. I, I think I've probably seen them all 15 times, but it still amuses me. Early on in that series... Samantha had a kitchen with um, an oven in the wall and a, a stove that came out and she oh. could push in. Mm. I have never seen that anywhere other than in that show. But yeah. what a great idea. Well, of course, you can't leave the elements on and push it back in. But regardless, the, the concept of being able to stow the things that you don't need Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I did hear several years ago that condos were being built in downtown Toronto that didn't really have kitchens at all. They had a microwave because who lives in downtown Toronto that actually cooks? And now yeah. with yeah. air fryers and such that you can just sit on the counter that can do virtually anything an oven can do. Yeah. I mean, we're coming up with so many cool things, but there are a lot of cool things that already exist like euro showers and wet rooms and no step yeah. entries that we could we could do to make people's lives so much better tell me what you're going to focus on in the next year ahead yeah so it's kind of a, it, it's it's um we've already kind of talked about it already but the the idea of uh what i would call small victories so i would say it, it's fair to say about myself that uh i've always thought big um, in terms of my goals, uh, right from being a young person, you know, this idea of making the world more accessible, right? And uh, I've come to the realization as I've um, as I'm going, I'm in my 60th year, I guess you can say. Uh, that's a pretty tough goal, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and it sometimes I feel like I'm just beating my head against the wall. So uh, I'm taking more joy, and I have been for the last year or so. Uh, more joy in what I would call the small victories. So uh, just acknowledging that I, uh, I'm i not always changing the world, but I'm helping out a client who has a disability and we're making their the, that person's house more accessible, that family's house uh, more accessible, uh, allows them to do more things. Uh, one of the comments that I always take great pride in is when uh, a client tells me that their three hour morning routine in the bathroom has been cut down to a half an hour a day. So that's two and a half hours every single day of their lives now that is given back to playing with their kids, uh, um, uh, enjoying, enjoying life and not having to deal with uh, uh, the obstacles of uh, a, a you know, poorly designed bathroom. Uh, so those, those, I guess, uh, in my mind, those were more insignificant victories as I've been uh, practicing as an architect and and I'm starting to realize that I I should value those victories uh, those those subtle changes more because they really are they're really helping right and um, I'm not going to change another architect's mind um, by saying well this is this is what you need to achieve um, but if they can achieve uh, a small um, a smaller goal uh, in their design. So if they're designing an industrial building or a small housing project, at least talk to your clients about making it more uh, accessible and what that might look like. And um, maybe you don't, you don't do it all, but you do some things like the no step entrance. Maybe the house isn't super accessible inside, but you've got that no step entrance or um, 
or the, you know, and again, the wet room would be a great thing as well. So I, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of just trying to embrace, uh, and I think this has a lot to do with just being older, uh, just to embrace the day and enjoy the day and try to, try to uh, do that education bit, um, uh, kind of one day at a time too. And, uh, uh, I think that's, that's sort of changed my perspective a bit. Uh, it's helped me kind of calm down and stress out a, a lot less about, uh, feeling like I'm not really helping. Um, uh, so, uh, I'm sometimes my own worst enemy when I am very critical of my own, my, myself with these things. So I just really, really enjoying, in, enjoying the, uh, the day and trying to at least make sure I, uh, uh, like this podcast, you know, just make sure I take time out of my day to do something that is, uh, I, uh, feels to me worthwhile and feels like I'm, I'm giving back, uh, in, in that way. Right. Sounds like you have some very worthwhile goals because you're right. Changing the life of one person and knowing that you made such a huge difference in their lives is everything. Like you, you can dine out on that for weeks. Really, I, I've done the same thing and had the same feeling. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Yeah. And and I've really, uh, in some respects, and and uh, I, it's really ch you know it's changed my life for sure. But I've also gained some really long relationships, and one that I just uh, I'm sure I've mentioned in a previous podcast, but one that just comes to mind, which kind of ties all of the, my hopes uh, together in a way. Um, and as an example of, of that is, is a house I did for, for a young man, uh, Daniel Ennett, who, you know, is somewhat of a, a celebrity himself and, and, and become well known here in the city of Edmonton. Um, uh, brilliant young guy in his thirties now, uh, working on some, um, productions of, of, uh, media and, uh, putting together, um, uh, documentaries and and uh, other uh, other um, shows um, using his knowledge he he ended up um, losing all four limbs to to a, a, a disease um, I know his mom always corrects me but I just say meningitis it's a, it's a it's a more medical term but essentially it's it's a form of meningitis um, and we designed a house for him to uh interestingly enough it ended up being a four level split home with ramps inside instead of stairs and uh his life was so much better because he could just he could operate a, a joystick on his wheelchair and just get around everywhere in the house and he and his mom uh uh it's just them that share the house and she uh, she could just, he could say, mom, I'm going to my room. And she could say, yeah, okay, fine. Go ahead. I'm just going to finish getting supper ready. That kind of thing. Their, their kitchen living area has been turned into um, a painting studio. They both paint now. Uh, Daniel's a fantastic uh, uh, artist. Uh, he's taken up photography, um, needs some help getting his camera set up on his wheelchair. He's such a creative young guy. And I'd like to think that the house and the way he was able to grow up in in the house uh, offered him that kind of independence that uh, gave him confidence to to take on the the challenges of of just day to day living for a young a young person. Um, and his maybe are a bit more challenging because of his his uh, um, missing limbs. Um, but you know he figured out a way to make it work, and now he's thriving and doing well. Uh, his friends would always gather at his house. Um, because it was hard for him to come to theirs. Uh, it normalized, uh, the house was normal for his friends. They didn't think anything of it. Um, so uh, not only does Daniel understand and his mom understand what accessible housing is all about, but so do all of Daniel's friends and, and family and friends of, of um, um, his mom as well, right? And uh, I um, class that I would teach, I'd bring bring my class to the, to the home and they would just often be stunned at how innovative and interesting the house is and the uh the young people um, some of daniel's friends were interested in becoming architects or getting into the design field um because their friend was daniel and they grew up in this or they uh, 
hung out in this interesting home. So uh, it does it does uh, go back to this idea of small small um, small little deeds or small pieces of work can have that ripple effect, right? In in terms of uh, out, uh, reaching other people and 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 then getting getting us to that critical mass of people that understand um, how to make better housing in a better built environment. Right. That's a lovely story to bring us to a conclusion on this podcast, unless there's mm-hmm. another wish or hope or dream that you want to sneak in. Uh, yeah, I hope to see my grandkids today. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's everything, isn't it? They're so delicious when they're young. You, and you've got some tiny ones. I've got, yeah, I've got uh, the oldest one. I've got five and the oldest one is four. So there's, there's, uh, yeah, I usually get a visit by uh, either three of them or two of them or all five sometimes all at once. So it's, uh, uh, let me tell you that, that sure picks up my day when I get to see them. That's for sure. And you have to form those relationships now because there will come a time where it's not so cool. Maybe they, not. Yeah, they will, yeah. But they will lean on that relationship and they will come mm-hmm. back to us later on. At least that's I, what I, I hope. I think so. I, I certainly I certainly feel that with my own kids too. They like to uh, they like to come over and hang out with uh, with my wife and myself. So um, not exactly sure how we did it, but we uh, we we created a situation where our, our kids do I, I feel like our kids really like us. <laughs> so <laughs> that's pretty awesome (laughs) that is well terrific well thank you for joining me again on this podcast and thank you to all of the people who have joined us uh, for this podcast and I look forward to seeing all of you on the next podcast the next episode of Real Life Renos the podcast Mm -hmm.